Hey everyone, Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail, bringing you our conclusion to our program, Rogues, Banditi, and Crackers, the Southern Backcountry in the American Revolution. So what we're talking about with this program are the tough partisan fighters, the backcountry militia that not only fought amongst themselves, but fought against the, the main armies, the British Army, the Continental Army. And why were these fighters so effective? Um, especially regarding those who opposed the British, it was largely the efforts of these groups that bogged down British advances through the Carolinas, bought the time needed for the Continental Army to rebuild a couple times, and finally keep them from conquering the South, using it like the back door to destroy the American Revolution. Um, but what we've, what we've seen happen throughout this entire series is that each community is fighting for itself. They're doing what they think is best for their survival, for their growth. Um, these communities are usually all their extended family networks of friends and family, um, sometimes same church congregations from Pennsylvania, from Virginia. Sometimes they knew each other all the way back in Ireland, and they're settling near each other now in, uh, in the Carolinas. Um, so they're going to kind of be in competition with the other communities. You see this sometimes in uh, competing land grants, land claims, trying to get the best river bottoms, the best farmland, trying to get on the places that are closest to the navigable rivers and the good trade routes. So that's going to cause a little bit of rift uh, amongst the communities there, just where you're kind of, you know, maybe I and your neighbor with a little bit, a bit of suspicion. Now, what you're also going to see happen is the Great Awakening. Now, this is a big unifying thing. Uh, some historians have talked about how this is possibly the only large unifying, um, you could call it a, a social trend that happens in the American colonies, in the British American world, uh, the British Atlantic world, uh, prior to the American Revolution, is this connection of these sermons that they hear as part of the Great Awakening. But as we saw in some of Woodmason's descriptions, he's blaming all the different denominations, especially the New Lights, the New Light Presbyterians, especially as being one of the, um, the negative factors on society. Um, what you're seeing happen, the New Lights, they're, they're, they're more energetic, they're more emotional in their services. Um, so they're, they're very attractive and charismatic to a lot of people. Um, and they're, they're allowing more opportunity for uh, women for African Americans to have roles in the services than you have seen in more traditional old light services. Um, so you're going to have a bit of a rift happen between new light and old light communities, but also this is just adding to what Woodmason described the the numerous denominations, the spider web of denominations of Baptists, Methodists, Anglicans, Lutherans, Huguenots, Quakers, Moravians, um, even small Jewish and Catholic communities throughout the uh, the Carolinas and the backcountry. Um, so this is going to be a, a lot of fractures there where people maybe aren't seeing eye to eye with their neighbors. Um, now, when the revolution happens in 1775, this is not the first time that war has come to the Carolinas. The Anglo-Cherokee War is going to be your most recent. Uh, that's going to be back in 1759 through 1761. Um, you're going to see large-scale devastation along the frontier, um, and those who didn't lose everything in um, attacks by, uh, by Cherokee warriors, um, they have abandoned everything. They were so terrified of the violence. Um, there's one quote from May of 1759 saying, in that um, many of them have desisted planting and others are fortifying them themselves. They are fleeing east as though the enemy were at their heels, end quote. Um, so what you're going to see happen in the wake of that war, once you have a peace treaty between the Cherokee Nation and the British government, um, you, this is kind of shortly followed up by more violence, more fighting in the north, uh, what's known as Pontiac's Rebellion in, around the Great Lakes in Ohio. Um, this is going to scare a lot more northern settlers, Virginians, Pennsylvanians. It's going to scare them south. So not only do you have that regular flow of immigration, now you have refugees fleeing south from the fighting. The same time you have those who fled the back country, usually have gone to the low country. Now they're trying to come back and rebuild themselves. So now it's almost like they're having to compete with these, these other waves of people all trying to come into the back parts of the Carolinas. Now, another rift that we're going to see as part of the Anglo-Cherokee War is a little bit of backcountry, low country animosity. Um, a lot of the backcountry people, when they called on the Colonial Assembly for aid, um, whether it be monetary aid, food, uh, military protection, they felt like the low country, the Colonial Assembly, did not step up, did not protect them. Um, so there's going to be a bit of a bit of a divide starts to develop there. 
Now, um, this is really going to finally tip the scales with the South Carolina regulator war. Um, at one point, at least 5,000, probably more than 5,000 men are going to join this group. They are backcountry South Carolina vigilantes. Um, Charles Wood Mason, uh, he's actually going to become an advocate for them. He's going to understand that a lot of their problems are due to a lack of law and order. So when they take the law into their own hands, he understands, he agrees. He's gonna write for them, sending their, um, their, their demands, sending their explanations down to the colonial government. Uh, here's one of his explanations I'm going to read for you. Uh, Wood Mason says, quote, but the people wearied out with being exposed to the depredations of robbers, people set down here just as a barrier between the rich planters and the Indians to secure the former against the latter, without laws or government, churches, schools, or ministers, with no police established and all property quite insecure, merchants as fearful to venture their goods as ministers their persons. The lands, though the finest in the province, are unoccupied, and rich men who are afraid to set their slaves to work or to clear them, lest they should become a prey to the banditti. No regard is to be had to the numberless petitions and complaints of the people. Thus neglected and slighted by those in authority, they rose in arms, pursued the rogues, broke up their gangs, burnt the dwellings of all their harborers and abettors, whipped and drove the idle, vicious, and profligate out of the province, men and women without distinction, and would have proceeded to Charlestown in a regular corps of 5,000 men and hung up the rogues before the state house in presence of governor and council. For the mildness of legislation here is so great, and the clemency of the chief and authority has been carried to such excess that when a notorious robber was with great pains catched and sent to town, and there tried and condemned, he always got pardoned by dint of money, and came back fifty times worse than before. The fellows, thus pardoned, formed themselves into a large gang, ranging the province with impunity. So what he's essentially talking about here is that um, they had to take the law into their own hands, they became vigilantes and they would have gone all the way to the gates of Charleston um, to try and get their, their wrongs addressed, to have these cases heard. Um, Governor Montague of South Carolina is actually going to raise a militia to combat them, the moderators, um, although they're going to be known by a slang term, the Scovillites, due to their leader's name, John Scoville. Um, but you're going to see these groups engage in skirmishes and clashes. Uh, there's no large battle. Uh, three commissioners from the governor are actually going to arrive just before a large battle can take place. They're going to have peace talks. They're going to get both sides to disband and go home after establishing a new court district and constructing a jail at 96, a, uh, a, the hub of the backcountry in South Carolina, the town of 96. That's going to be in 1772, so just a few years away from the American Revolution. Um, so what you're going to see as a result of this is a split in the backcountry between those who were former regulators and those who were former moderators. Um, you're going to end up with a crew of backcountry leading figures who have practiced not only um, political authority but military authority in those neighborhoods against some of their local people. And you're also going to get a distrust of the low country. Uh, especially the, the colony elites. A lot of the backcountry folks, they don't actually believe the low country has their interests at heart. Um, <clears throat> now, you're actually going to see this um, one neat occasion of this bleeding over into the revolution with uh, Richard Richardson's snow campaign of 1775. Uh, a leading patriot officer, he's going to arrest um, a lot of loyalists or suspected backcountry loyalists. And next to some of their names, several of them, he has the word Scovillite or Scovillite listed next to them. This being a reference to the moderators back in the Regulator War. So that's going to be a, a direct connection that you're going to see there. Now, while the South Carolina Regulators are pro-government, they want the governor to step in, they want courts, they want sheriffs, the North Carolina Regulators are going to be different. This is going to be happening about the same time. You're going to see the North Carolina Regulators take up arms, begin protesting and forming to, uh, to contest um, corrupt government officials. So they're looking at Governor William Tryon's taxation, um, requiring them to pay in coin, this, the confiscation of their farms, property of their goods for back taxes, but the corruption of the tax officials and the sheriffs who are in charge of collecting those taxes 
often collecting way more than they're supposed to, exponentially more than they're supposed to, and then seizing property when they can't pay that outrageous fee. Um, you know, there, there is going to be a final large clash with the North Carolina regulators, the Battle of Alamance in May of 1771, where Governor Tryon is going to march militias against the regulators, against the protesters, fire on them, engage them with battle there, and proceed to pursue and arrest um, all throughout parts of the back country. So the result here is you're going to have this mistrust between the Western farmers and kind of the Eastern wealthy planters and the colonial officials. Uh, you're going to have a desire for royal inter intervention to prevent colonial corruption. Um, so the back country does not trust the, uh, the colonial government, not the British government. Both of these have been against the colonial government. Um, so they are not as pro-British as you may have thought. Um, <clears throat> And talking about this low country, back country rift, something else that you're going to see outside of uh, these armed conflicts is just the lack of representation. That's going to be a big problem for a lot of back country leading figures as they're growing their communities, establishing um, their, their stores and their trade networks, their communities. Um, for example, South Carolina, by the time of the revolution, about 75% of the voting age men are going to be in the back country, um, you know, the western half. Of the, uh, of the colony, 75%, but they only have 10% of the seats in the colonial assembly. So that's going to mean that the power in the colony is going to be controlled by the elite coastal planters and merchants. Um, so when those coastal elites begin to organize committees of safety and send delegates to a committee of, uh, to a, a continental congress, um, they're going to invite the back country to join with them. They're going to try and spread their influence, but it's a question of who whose side are they going to be on? You know, are the backcountry people going to join in with the Eastern Low Country elite, or are they going to say, no, it's the king who has our interests at heart, we don't trust you guys, and they're going to stay loyal. Um, this is going to be a big rift that's going to be in the backcountry. And when the pressure of revolution is applied in 1775, when shots are fired, all these numerous fractures, um, whether they be economic, religious, political, um, just vendettas and grudges, those are going to break open into just this network of fractures, and it's going to kind of dictate what side these guys are, these guys are going to join on. A lot of uh, old scars by the time 1775 rolls around. Now, by the time the British are arriving in the Southern Campaign, successfully launching their Southern strategy in uh, South Carolina the spring of 1780, um, they don't know it, but they're already about five years too late. Now, their whole plan had hinged upon the idea of they can work their way up from East Florida, retaking Georgia, the Carolinas, using the reported uh, thousands of loyal backcountry colonists, um, especially the backcountry. Um, just using these guys to make up for the fact that they're soldiers, they're British regulars, they are being called away elsewhere. They're fighting the Continentals up north, and now by this point of the war, the French and the Spanish, soon the Dutch, um, they are having to fight all over the globe, so they need to use local manpower. And what the British fail to realize is that there's this spider web of complications, all these vendettas, all these feuds that have been cracked open in 1775 and have just been spiraling out of control, snowballing in ferocity ever since then. Um, now, when, in 1775, when this broke open, the Patriots, they, they pretty quickly seize power. Um, they're going to see um, a utilization of tactics such as uh, you see uh, intimidation, um, you see what we would consider domestic terrorism, you see assaults, imprisonments, um, property just confiscation by your neighbors, just showing up saying you haven't joined us so your stuff is ours now, um, throwing you in jail. Um, this is going to uh, be kind of the, the norm under the Patriot control for any loyalists. Um, a lot of them are going to try and flee. They're going to get down to British Florida. They're going to hide out in the frontier. They're going to try and just join the Patriots um, until an opportunity presents itself. Um, and that opportunity is going to come when you have the large British army in that spring of 1780 get up into the Carolinas and have a few crushing victories over the Continentals. This gives those loyalists their chance for revenge. They're coming back with the British from Florida, they're coming out of the frontiers, they're coming out of the woodwork, out of hiding, and they want revenge. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about here is um, some of the, the, the brutality of the fighting. This is not to say this is a uniquely southern backcountry issue. 
Um, you see brutality all throughout the revolution in every theater, every community. But what we're looking at here is specifically how this is kind of just the, it's the natural progression, how this is the next step um, and how this was so vicious that you have outsiders are writing back about it, the British generals, the Continental Army generals. Um, and we have to keep in mind that they are noting it and they are writing about it because it is so extreme, it is so bad. It's kind of like watching the evening news headlines. If you just watch the headlines and think that that's all that's out there in the world, you'll think it's a terrible, awful place. Um, the good stuff isn't always talked about, but the bad stuff definitely is. Uh, so keep that in mind as we share some of these accounts here. Um, but like we're talking about with the loyalists wanting vengeance, both sides are going to have personal vendettas, personal vengeance as a, a motivator. Um, one patriot, a uh, Thomas Young, he's 16 years old when his brother is killed by loyalists. And after the war, he writes that when he heard the news, he tore open his shirt, vowed vengeance and personally killed 100 loyalists by the time the war ended. Now you're also going to see people who were maybe, they would have been neutral, um, but they are going to be pushed to one side by attempted intimidation. Um, Thomas Brown is a plantation owner in Augusta, outside of Augusta, Georgia. Um, he is going to be attacked, assaulted uh, by the Committee of Safety, by local patriots. He's uh, arrested, he's tortured, he's mutilated, um, and he's going to escape and become one of the most active and notorious loyalist officers of the Southern Campaign. Um, another man, Richard Paris, who is a suspected loyalist, didn't actually do anything, but he's arrested for nine months without trial, finally takes the oath, joins the Patriot side, only to find that his home had been burned, his uh, family had been abused and assaulted, um, his business had been destroyed, and he tries to just stick it out, but eventually he's going to flee, join the loyalists, and one of his sons is actually going to join with Thomas Brown and his loyalists and fight through the, through the war. Um, and there are some guys who change sides because of these, these, these tactics, these intimidation tactics. Um, William Cunningham is a great example of this. William Cunningham is a backcountry patriot when the war first begins, but due to um, some disagreements with his officers, he's punished because he won't go to the low country. Um, there's a few different variations of his story, whether it was a cousin who was assaulted or his father had been assaulted by low country patriots, someone that maybe been murdered. Um, but he is going to change sides, become a loyalist. And by the end of the revolution, he will be known as Bloody Bill Cunningham for the uh, the, 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 the vendetta that he holds against patriots, the atrocities, the war crimes that he and his men are going to commit. Now, um, even during the war, I mean, British officers are noting that you have this motivation amongst the loyalists. Uh, the British commissary officer under Cornwallis, a Charles Stedman, he wrote just after the revolution, he said that a lot of the troops who are engaged in these kind of irregular kind of incursions, they have been obliged to flee their homes, to flee the Carolinas and Georgia, and he says that they harbored all the resentment against their persecutors, which can be supposed to arise from the unworthy treatment they had received. Now, when these backcountry groups, these, these partisan bands, when they do fight, um, they are fighting in their way a lot of the times. They're utilizing what we talked about in episode one, that kind of backcountry stereotype, that Fess Parker quote about the, uh, the surest rifle and the fastest horses and the ugliest dog and all that. Um, they're using those rifles and horses in their tactics. Um, they're hit and run, they're using ambushes. Um, and so here we have some ac accounts that talk about these rifles and horses. You have an English woman visiting Virginia in 75, a Miss Harvey. She says, quote, I am just returned from the back parts where I seed 8,000 men in arms, all with rifled barrel guns, which they can hit the bigness of a dollar between two and 300 yards distance. Dear Godfather, tell all my country people not to come here, for the Americans will kill them like deer in the woods, and they will never see them. They can lie on their backs and load and fire, and every time they draw sight at anything, they are sure to kill or cripple, and they run in the woods like horses. Another British officer who is serving here in the Carolinas, George Hanger, he's going to talk about these tactics as well. He says, quote, the crackers and militia in these parts of America are all mounted on horseback which renders it totally impossible to force them to an engagement with infantry only. When they choose to fight, they dismount, fasten their horses to the fences and rails, but if not very confident in the superiority of their numbers, they remain on horseback, give their fire, and retreat, which renders it useless to attack them without cavalry. 
Now, other British officers are going to note that these abilities are not exclusive to the Patriots, but the Loyalist militia also have these horses and rifles. Uh, Patrick Ferguson is going to note that you can use these guys, use these skills that they're bringing to the table. He says, quote, the backcountry people are, quote, very fit for rough and irregular war, being all excellent woodsmen, unerring shots, careful to a degree to prevent waste or damage to their ammunition, and inured to hardship. Now, they are going to be fighting against um, these similar riflemen and horsemen. One of the men who serves under Ferguson, a loyalist, Captain Alexander Chesney. Uh, we actually heard from him earlier when he immigrated from Ireland with his family in episode two, I want to say. Episode two, they came from Ireland straight into uh, Charleston, into the backcountry. Um, he's going to be a loyalist in the revolution. He says that at Kings Mountain, quote, uh, when they were attacked, it was by all of whom were armed with rifles, well-mounted, and of course could move with the utmost celerity. So here you have those rifles and horses being used again. Um, Charles Stedman, when the British are occupying Charlotte in the, uh, the fall of uh, 1780, he's going to say that when they're there in Charlotte, the inhabitants made it a practice to waylay the British foraging parties, fire their rifles from concealed places, and then fly into the woods. Now, the use of these horses and rifles is not always a good thing. Uh, Nathaniel Grain, commander of the Southern Continental Army after December of 1780, he's going to talk about these guys. He's going to say um, that when they show up and you're just trying to feed and supply all of these men and their horses, he says, quote, you may as well attempt to bail the sea dry as to think of arming and equipping the whole militia of this country. The manner of going to war all on horseback will lay waste a whole country, and the manner of feeding and subsisting them is generally three times as expensive as regular troops. And he's not alone in this opinion. Continental General Daniel Morgan, this famous frontier rifleman guy, he also has a similar opinion. He writes back to Green complaining about some of these problems um, just prior to the Battle of Cowpens, two days prior. Uh, Morgan writes on January 15th, 1781, quote, we have to feed such a number of horses that the most plentiful country must soon be exhausted. Could the militia be persuaded to change their fatal mode of going to war? Much provision might be saved, but the custom has taken such deep root that it cannot be abolished. Now, not only are these guys kind of, come, you know, um, coming and fighting, on uh, with horseback and with their rifles but sometimes they're only fighting when they want to when they choose to uh the british are going to note this uh, archibald campbell in georgia in 1779 capturing savannah and augusta uh, famously rending a star and stripe from the flag of america as he called it um, he's going to say that his force is joined by irregulars from the upcountry called crackers who had joined the british in augusta um, so they're coming down to join up with him now that he's present but these same, the same group in Georgia, a couple years later, are going to be noted by a Hessian officer to have a very high desertion rate. Um, he says, quote, a detachment of Creekers, um, people who are living on the little rivers and creeks, they are in return for provisions, taking up arms in behalf of the government, but they are now deserting in great numbers. Um, Nathaniel Green, again, uh, talking to Thomas Sumter, a very famous uh, partisan officer, the, the Gamecock in South Carolina, um, he's saying that the effectiveness of these militia, of these partisans, it depends if they are fighting in their homes, for their homes, or they're being sent to fight elsewhere. Um, he's writing to Thomas Sumter, who has been fighting for his home. His men are local, and there are North Carolinians coming down to join them. They're being sent to come help out. Green says, quote, I tell you in confidence, I am in distress. My fears increase respecting subsistence. If the state of North Carolina continue to bring out such shoals of useless militia as they have done the last season, it will be impossible to subsist an army in this country. Ten of the militia drawn out in classes are not worth one of your men, whose all depend upon their own bravery. What gives safety to one brings on ruin to the other. If your militia do not fight, their families are exposed. If the others run away, their persons are safe. So a big difference there between if these militia are fighting for their homes or if they're fighting someplace else. Um, this is also going to be a problem talking about Thomas Sumter. General Morgan is trying to gather uh, supplies in January of 81, sending out commissary officers who run into some of Sumter's Patriot militia 
but they come back with nothing. Um, he's explaining why this commissary had no assistance. He says, quote, um, General Sumter had directed him, meaning uh, his officers, had directed his officers to obey no orders from me unless they came through him. So here you have Sumter saying, it doesn't matter if they're Continentals, it doesn't matter if they need help, do not send any help to them unless I tell you to. Now, uh, something else that you're gonna see happen here is when you have both sides fighting for what they view as a legitimate government. Um, the loyalists for king, the patriots for Congress, they're not always gonna view the enemy as soldiers, but as criminals. Um, so they're not always gonna get proper treatment as prisoners of war. But sometimes you're going to see a lot of abuses, uh, murders, the sense of betrayal existing between these two sides. One British officer wrote about, he says, quote, I cannot even hint upon the scenes before me, which are beyond description wretched. Every misery which the bloodiest cruel war ever produced, the violence of the passions of these people are beyond every curb of religion and humanity. They are unbounded, and every hour exhibits dreadful, wanton, mischiefs, murders, and violence of every kind unheard of before. And that's coming from General Charles O'Hara, Cornwallis's second in command um, in December of 1780, when they're wintering over in South Carolina. Now, the British aren't the only ones that noticed this. Nathaniel Green, again, commanding here in the South, uh, commanding the Continentals, he's gonna write back to his wife, Katie, this moving letter. He says, quote, human misery has become a subject for sport and ridicule. With us, the difference between Whig and Tory is little more than a division of sentiment. But here, they persecute each other with little less than savage fury. A captain who is now with me and who has just got his family from near the lines of the enemy had his sister murdered a few days since and seven of her children wounded, the oldest not 12 years of age. The sufferings and distress of the inhabitants beggars all description and requires the liveliest imagination to conceive the cruelties and devastations which prevail. Um, and you're gonna have numerous accounts like this. You have uh, Lieutenant Anthony Allaire. He says that as a, when he's captured by the Patriots, he says that the Patriot guards, the officers are just walking amongst the prisoners with their swords cutting and wounding, quote, whom their wicked and savage minds prompted. This is a specimen of, of rebel lenity. Um, you're also going to see loyalist report, uh, loyalist officers pass along reports to their other British commanders saying these men have been assaulted, these men have been ambushed, these men have been cut down even though they were unarmed. Um, the Royal Gazette in 1782 includes a, a description of General Rutherford's mark, um, which is where a patriot General Rutherford of North Carolina militia is having his men cut every loyalist prisoner that they capture. Um, you are also going to see executions of prisoners. Um, a few guys become kind of notorious for this, especially Paddy Carr, a Georgia Patriot, who when he sees nine prisoners uh, uh, executed, he says, quote, would to God every tree in the forest bore such fruit as that. Um, he's saying this looking at nine men are hanging from these tree limbs. Um, and it's gonna come back to get him. He's actually going to be tracked down after the war and murdered by the child of one of his victims. And in his eulogy, um, it doesn't appear that anyone's surprised by this. He kind of he kind of scared everybody, no matter what side they were on. Um, let's see, you've also got um, William Cunningham. We mentioned him earlier. Uh, some of the um, things that he does going through and taking prisoners and then executing them. Um, if one attempt fails, he'll try a different way. Um, he's trying to hang some prisoners and a limb breaks, so his men draw swords instead and use their swords. Um, some of his men are going to try and come back after the war, after the peace treaty, after they think that they've been absolved, and legally they have. Um, one guy, Matthew Love, is actually going to be um, arrested, and the judge is going to say, yeah, you know, under the peace treaty, you're, you're good to go. But the people say, no, he's not. And they actually, um, they, they attack him and they murder him in the woods outside the jail. And that's in, um, in 1783, outside 96, South Carolina. Um, and that judge, Adanis Burke, he's also gonna note this kind of, the, what he's seen happen. He says, quote, uh, from the habit of putting their enemies to death, they have reconciled their minds to the killing of each other. And that man, by custom, may be so brutalized as to relish human blood. And it's not limited to soldiers. Um, you see one time a, a wife of a loyalist, a Peggy Crawford, is gonna come back into um, 
South Carolina to try and reclaim her family property that was lost. And the story goes that when the local uh, Patriot wives, when they hear that Peggy is back, um, they know who she is. They know who her husband is. They actually go drag her out of the house where she's staying, tie her to a tree, and take turns whipping her um, as vengeance for what she and her husband had stood for. Um, you see officers executed sometimes. Uh, Major James Dunlap, uh, James Grierson um, are going to be loyalist prisoner officers um, assassinated by their guards. Um, and even with James Grierson, General Green offers a $10,000 bounty for the assassin, but no one steps up or speaks up. Um, now, some of these assassinations, they're going to say, are politically motivated. Like, for example, you have if um, at the Siege of Augusta in 1780, there's going to be, quote, 50 odd prisoners are going to be captured. Uh, patriots are going to be captured with protections in their pockets, meaning they had come in and sworn allegiance back to the crown, saying they would not fight anymore. This makes them viewed as traitors, not as soldiers. So it says, quote, 27 of them were hanged at Augusta and 27 brought to 96 to share the same fate. Um, there are going to be times that officers try to stop this. Like, for example, at the Battle of Kings Mountain, when you have patriots are firing into the surrendering loyalists, their commander, William Campbell, is going to run amongst the men, knocking down rifles, yelling out, for God's sake, don't shoot. It is murder to kill them now, for they have raised the flag. Um, but you see this same kind of idea of that you're not seeing the enemy as soldiers, but they're, they're, they're sub-soldiers. Um, Patrick Ferguson, when he's trying to call the loyalists to arms October 1st, 1780 in uh, Denard's Ford in North Carolina, he's going to describe them as, quote, an inundation of barbarians. That's how he describes the patriots who are coming towards them. He's, he doesn't say they're going to defeat you in battle. He says um, that the loyalists, if you remain home, if these guys find you, you will be, quote, pinioned, robbed, or murdered, and their wives and daughters abused by the dregs of mankind. Um, he's going to later call them a set of mongrels, and that if the loyalists do not step up and fight these men, quote, the, 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 uh, their women should, quote, turn their back upon you and look for real men to protect them. Um, but again, officers who are noting the violence and speaking up against it, Lord Cornwallis, uh, when he's going to hear about some of the executions of loyalist prisoners, he's going to write to the Continental Army on November 10th. 1780 and say, quote, I must now observe that the cruelty exercised on the prisoners taken under Major Ferguson is shocking to humanity and the hanging poor old Colonel Mills, who was always a fair and open enemy to your cause, was an act of the most savage barbarity, end quote. Now, in response to this letter, the Continental officer writes back with a list of names of Patriot prisoners who had been executed by the British, like those captured at Augusta with protections in their pockets. Um, another time you're going to see a, uh, in Lieutenant Anthony Allaire's account of being a prisoner after Kings Mountain, he says a, quote, Dr. Johnson was insulted and knocked down by Colonel Cleveland, meaning uh, Benjamin Cleveland, the Patriot leader. He says, quote, for attempting to dress the wounds of a man whom the rebels had cut on the march. The rebel officers would often go in amongst the prisoners, draw their swords, uh, cut and wound whom their wicked and savage minds prompted. Um, another time you know, before that, you have so many abuses of the Kings Mountain prisoners, especially that William Campbell on October 10th has to pass a general order saying that the guards should, quote, stop the slaughtering and disturbing of the prisoners on the line of march. And he asks for all the officers to help restrain the men. Now, while you see this kind of um, they're not viewed as as soldiers, um, sometimes atrocities are just purely personal. Um, they're being played out in the fighting. Uh, men who have seen their homes burned, they've seen their livestock stolen or confiscated. Um, sometimes they're relying on plundering the enemy back to rebuild their farms. They can rebuild their community, maybe even come out a little bit ahead. So plundering and murdering are going to be described by numerous officers as huge problems in the backcountry. Um, Charles Stedman says uh, as early as about 1776, 77, he says, quote, between the inhabitants of East Florida and those of Georgia, a kind of predatory war had been carried on, the object of which seems to have been sometimes plunder and sometimes revenge. Um, Patrick Ferguson, going back to this guy in September 9th, when he is first kind of entering North Carolina, trying to uh, rally loyalist militia, he blames the fact that the war is still happening. He blames those who have committed such crimes that they cannot possibly return to a peaceful society. 
or he says, quote, having got a habit of rapine and plunder, wished to continue to rob in the confusion of the times. Under the last description are the parties lately from Georgia, Nolichucky, and some scoundrels of both sides, end quote. So Ferguson is specifically saying the Overmountain men, the Georgians, they are just plundering. That's why they want the war to keep going. That's why they're still fighting. Um, if Ferguson is worried about these plunderers, he really do thinks he really does think that they are a main force keeping the war going in the Carolinas. So he's going to write to Lord Cornwallis on September 19th of 1780 and say, quote, it appears to me of some importance to settle this corner, meaning uh, Western North Carolina. Uh, he says, through which alone the backwater plunderers can infest South Carolina. So not even calling them soldiers or fighters. He just says they're plunderers, plain and simple. Um, and Ferguson is going to advocate a stop to the plundering. He's going to state that any loyalists, quote, who by plunder and outrage disgrace the name of loyalists will be punished even to death as scoundrels who wish to continue to their country the miseries of war, end quote. Um, he's going to also put this out to the Patriots. He's going to say, look, the British Army, we are trying to stop the plundering. He says, quote, the king's troops have exert exerted themselves to restrain the resentment of the loyalists and prevent bad men on both sides from aggravating the horrors of war by rapine and outrage. Now, William Campbell, he's going to note that this is a problem too. this Patriot officer. He's going to say, yeah, there's a lot of plundering going on. As they're leaving Kings Mountain and heading back home, he's going to hear so many accounts of um, his men plundering that he's going to have to pass more orders for the guys to cut it out. He says, quote, it is with anxiety that I hear the complaints of the inhabitants on account of the plundering parties who issue out of camp and indiscriminately rob both Whig and Tory, leaving our friends, I believe, in a worse situation than the enemy would have done. Um, November 16, 1780, Anthony Allaire, he's going to be one of those loyalist prisoners. He's going to escape. And as he's escaping, he's going to talk about coming across a family who, quote, this poor family were so completely stripped of everything they had by the rebels that they could give us nothing but a hoe cake and some dried beef, which was but a very indifferent repast for hungry stomachs, end quote. A uh, similar account is going to come from Alexander Chesney. He's going to be a scout. Um, for Bannister Tarleton at the Battle of Cowpens. Um, when that is an American victory, he flees. He goes back home nearby on the Packlet River. He's going to find his wife and his infant child with not even a blanket in the house. No food, no clothing, no blankets in January. And he's going to realize that they have been stripped of everything by the Patriots, by General Morgan's army. He's going to gather his wife and his kid. He's going to flee down to the Low Country to Charleston, try and get some shelter there. Now, General Nathaniel Green. Uh, in command in the, the winter of 1780 into 1781, leading the Continentals, trying to rebuild the army. He's going to describe to other outsiders, those who are not there to, to witness how bad it is, he's going to talk about the fighting, the looting, the murdering. He says, quote, the great bodies of militia that have been in service this year, employed against the enemy, and in quelling the Tories, they have almost laid waste the country and so corrupted the principles of the people that they think of nothing but plundering one another. He's going to report to Congress uh, that next week. He's going to say, quote, the spirit of plundering which prevails among the inhabitants adds not a little to our difficulties. The whole country is in danger of being laid waste by the Whigs and Tories who pursue each other with as much relentless fury as beasts of prey. People between this and the Santee River are frequently murdered as they ride along the road. Um, he's also going to write uh, a couple weeks later to General Thomas Sumter. He's going to say, quote, plunder and depredation prevail so in every quarter that I am not a little apprehensive. All this country will be laid waste. Most people appear to be in pursuit of private gain or personal glory. Um, that summer, he's actually going to share a report with uh, Green is going to share a report with Andrew Pickens, saying that you have uh, Colonel Leroy Hammond's regiment are so uh, plundering and attacking a settlement outside of the um, uh, Perkins Ford on the Saluda River down near 96 that they need they need intervention. They need guards from the Patriot government to go protect them from the Patriot government. Um, he's going to go on to explain, quote, the idea of exterminating the Tories is not less barbarous than impolitic. 
if persisted in, will keep this country in the greatest confusion and distress. The eyes of the people are much upon you, and the disaffected cry for mercy. And I hope you will exert yourself to bring over the Tories to our interest, and to check the growing enormities which prevail among the Whigs in punishing and plundering as private avarice or a bloody disposition stimulates them. This is going to be a big problem uh, in Georgia, especially. Green's going to write to uh, Georgia Patriot leader Elijah Clark saying, quote, two very capital evils which rage in this country and which, if not prevented, must soon depopulate it. I mean, private murders and plundering, they both originate from such a base principle and are so unworthy the soldier of honor or merit that I can have no charity for those who are guilty of either. And as I am, as I am, am informed both of those practices prevail with parties living over the mountains who are carrying away Negroes and committing other enormities which want checking. This is one of the few places that we actually have a reference to these groups who are attacking and raiding, they're plundering. This is what, what are they taking? They're even capturing enslaved people. They are kidnapping these people from their enslavement to other enslavement over in their own settlements. Um, that is the level that this has risen to. Um, Nathaniel Green is going to keep writing to uh, Andrew Pickens. He's going to say that the confusion and disorder which prevails in Georgia by private murders and plundering parties are growing evils that will soon, if left alone, become a national curse. Um, you're going to go see actually um, Henry Lee. He is going to write to General Green and say that if you do not instill martial law soon, do something, um, Georgia will be destroyed. There will be no Georgia left if you don't try to stop all this. Now, in one of the few letters we have from Andrew Pickens, he's going to write back to General Green in the summer of 1781. He's fighting down there in his home district of 96. Um, he's going to write on uh, July 25th of 81, quote, that spirit of plunder so general among our own people seems to be the greatest difficulty we labor under at present. People who have moved their families to the remote parts of North Carolina and Virginia, at least many of them seem to make a trade of carrying off everything valuable out of the country, either the property of friend or enemy. The loss of our horses distress us in a most particular manner. And this is not going to be limited to the fighting. Even when you have the main campaigns have moved on, the armies are elsewhere. Um, this still is going to continue. Governor Thomas Burke in North Carolina in 1782, when most of your fighting is confined down to the South Carolina low country, he's going to say that the, there are people with predatory habits, as he puts it, and they are being, gener or being originally outlaws, have become, quote, remorseless plunderers and murderers. Um, later in North Carolina that June, someone traveling through the, the central area, kind of the Charlotte area, up to what's now Winston-Salem, um, they're going to say, quote, most of the plantations that we passed were either abandoned or burned. Now and then one was inhabited, but they had nothing. And later that year in South Carolina, General William Moultrie is going to travel from the low country up across into the back country. He's going to describe not seeing any animals or livestock on his entire journey, except, quote, a few camp scavengers, meaning vultures, who are picking at someone's bones who hadn't been buried. Um, with his tour of the back country, he's going to later say that the 96th district, that western district created in 1772 because of the regulators, in that one district alone, there are 1,400 widows and orphans. Um, and this is not going to be limited to the Carolinas, but following into Georgia in 82, General Lachlan McIntosh is going to say that robbery, quote, has grown to such a height by a lawless, savage, and unprincipled banditti that traveling a mile upon the roads was unsafe in most of Georgia. And another great quote from Henry Lee talking about um, the, the plundering and the effect it's going to have. He says not only is martial law needed in Georgia, but he says that, uh, quote, um, they exceed the Goths and Vandals in their schemes of plunder, murder, and iniquity. All this under the pretense of supporting the virtuous America." Quote. Now you do see generals 
they, they try to use the armies. They try to organize and use these militias to support the main cause, but they run into all these problems because of their fighting in their own way, because of all the, the derailing that you're seeing happen away from the main mission by these feuds and vendettas. Green writes to Morgan, he says, quote, the militia you know are always unsuspicious and therefore are the most easily surprised. Don't depend too much upon them. He's going to go on in another letter and say that the private views and fears of the colonies are going to keep so many militia around, um, but they're of no more use than if they were on the moon. They're there, but you can't really use them in the battles. Um, the army can't use them. And Green is going to complain again to the North Carolina Board of War, the, the state government responsible for running their military operations. He says it is in vain to collect large bodies of irregular troops with an expectation of driving the enemy out of the country. They cannot be long subsisted in the field, nor can they oblige the enemy to fight them unless it is upon their own terms. Uh, a similar thought about how to use these guys. Green writes to Thomas Sumter. He says, quote, partisan strokes in war are like the garnish of a table. They give splendor to the army and reputation to the officers, but they afford no substantial national security. And the British are going to face this same problem. Lord Cornwallis reports to his commander, Sir Clinton, after Kings Mountain, the loss of Ferguson, the loss of so many well-trained loyalist militia. He says, quote, the militia of 96 on which alone we could place the smallest dependence was so totally disheartened by the defeat of Ferguson that of the whole district, we could with difficulty assemble 100. And even those, I am convinced, would not have made the smallest resistance if they had been attacked. He's gonna go on to say that the constant incursions of refugees, North Carolinians, back mountain men, the perpetual risings in different parts of this province, the invariable successes of all those parties against our militia, keep the whole country in continual alarm and render the assistance of regular troops everywhere necessary. And this goes right back to where we opened up this program in episode one. The British Army is having to spread themselves so thin, extra guards, extra outposts, extra garrisons because of these backcountry fighters. Um, because the Loyalist militia, when they were tried to be organized and formed into a fighting force, it was five years too late. Five years of fighting against their patriot neighbors. But who were these backcountry people? They came from the British Empire and sometimes beyond. They were drawn to the new world by opportunities and pushed out of the old world by religious, economic, or political pressures. So they came to wherever the best future was offered, from Pennsylvania down through the Shenandoah Valley into the, the back country, the Carolinas, and Georgia. And some took an even larger gamble and broke the law crossing the mountains because they saw that chance for a better future for themselves. Now, these decades of migration and hardship and competition, it created these little insulated communities who were willing to fight for what they had built against any enemy, foreign or domestic. And when the British Army formulated their plan to crush the American Revolution in the South, they assumed that defeating the Continental Army was the key to victory. Makes sense. But little did they know that their biggest problem in the South wouldn't be the trained soldiers but it'd be these guys. It'd be the small groups of rogues, banditti, and crackers. So I'm Ranger William from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.